Shardio for hosting and providing the lunch. We've got a fantastic event for you today. We've got Kevin Nowak from Uber and also Dave Fowler from Shardio. They're going to have a quick uh, panel discussion. Uh, before we get into the main affair, I wanted to give you guys a little background uh, about SFDA Science. Um, so we are fairly new organization, we're about eight months old. Uh, we've got about 1,400 members so far. Uh, we basically uh, run SF Data Science at SF Academy. We have uh, a bunch of meetups, typically about one or two uh, a week, and also a bunch of learns. So uh, we're super excited to have you. We couldn't do this uh, without you guys. And uh, if you guys are going to tweet about this event, I suggest you use the uh, SF Data Science hashtag. We have a lot of really cool insights from today's discussion. Uh, help us keep it all in um, really quickly, I wanted to give you a brief overview of who Zipian Academy is. We're basically a uh, training academy for data science and data engineering. That's a 12 week three month program, fully immersive, uh, where we take you through everything you need to know uh, to be uh, transitioned into a career in data science or data engineering. What we focus on are practical skills um, that are actually going to be used in industry. Uh, we have wonderful guest lecturers and mentors uh, like Kevin who come around and uh, help um, our students transition. Um, basically eight weeks of structured curriculum, a capstone project, and then we have a huge hiring day where we bring in about 20 or 30 companies um, to have a bunch of speed interviews. Um, we're looking for people to get involved. Uh, if you would like to, if you're a data scientist and want to guest lecture, um, if you have a data set that you uh, would like to have some help crunching, we're always looking for good primary data sets. It's one of the hardest things to, to find in an educational institution. Um, we're also looking for cluster resources. We have a new data engineering program coming online, so if you have a big Hadoop cluster that you're not doing anything with, uh, please let us know. We'd love to use it. And uh, also, uh, we have a hiring day about three times per year. If you're looking to hire data scientists, um, please come find me after the event. Uh, we would love to get you guys on board. Um, a few quick announcements. We our applications are open for our data science immersive. Uh, next one starts in September. Uh, we're also launching a data engineering immersive, which is focused on building scalable data pipelines in January of 2015. Uh, we also have two workshops, which are this weekend and the following weekend. Uh, the first one is about machine learning for growth. So it's advanced data testing. Um, doing things like multi-armed bandit, also uh, doing term prediction, code analysis, funnel analysis, and then an interactive uh, data visualization workshop with D3. These are a full weekend, two-day affair, uh, hands-on at, at our facility uh, in the mission. <coughs> so with that, I want to turn it over to Dave and Ben, and they're going to have a wonderful panel for you guys. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, uh, yes, as you said, I'm Dave from Chardio. Uh, a quick little background on Chardio. We basically connect to databases. Uh, we'll connect to your Redshift, MySQL, Postgres, uh, any kind of data sources that you have. Uh, and we pull out the schema and we make a nice drag and drop interface for you to create charts and dashboards of your data. We're very focused on trying to get uh, data science and, and business intelligence in the hands of everyone on your team uh, so that the data scientists inside of the company can have an easier time just making the charts and dashboards and sharing it with everyone on the team. And also, you can kind of offload some of the easier charts uh, if your boss keeps asking you every week for the same chart, uh, or if he wants to just tweak it slightly, uh, giving them the power to, to, to get that stuff themselves. So that's a quick little background on Chardio. I don't think we need much of a background on Uber. Uber is basically, right, you know, you, you, it's, it's a better capture. What would this? <laughs> we are an on-demand transportation platform. Essentially, yeah. we help connect anybody who does transportation with all the cities and people who can drive. Right. Good line. No, you did not use the word cab. Uh, <laughs> My legal team with that. My legal team. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so great, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Um, absolutely. So, why don't we start with a little background on you? So, you started in in physics. Yeah. Uh, well. So yeah, I was, uh, I'm a physicist by training. Um, I was always a kind of terrible physicist, if we're being totally honest. Uh, I uh, <laughs> basically, basically we, I skewed towards like computer programming. I mean, loved one else was like playing around with lasers and light bricks and all the other physics stuff. I'm like trying to make holograms on computers. I mean, it's all math, but but I was never really like the prototypical future physicist. Uh, Went to graduate school in Michigan State, working in a particle accelerator. I actually worked in the nuclear physics program, uh, mainly because they had the coolest models, if we're being totally honest. They had supercomputer time, they had 
know, the machine learning pros in the physics department. Uh, I thought I wanted to teach. That lasted about five minutes into teaching my first course. Um, and sort of was realizing this wasn't really the future for me. So uh, a friend of mine actually from college called me up about this bizarre cat thing uh, in about July 2011. Ended up uh, going out to interview. They made me an offer pretty much that first weekend. So I dropped out of grad school with, uh, with a master's. I was about 18 months away from finishing. So I'd like, I'd done my calls, I'd done all the classes, had my committee, was doing my research, like probably the worst possible time to drop out of grad school, like all the hard part was done. Um, but no, but I got the opportunity to come in, I was the 20th employee in Uber, and, uh, and been here ever since. Yeah, so that was like three and a half years ago? Yeah, so I joined July 2011, so three years will be two months ago. <laughs> What was the uh, data team like then? <laughs> and uh, sure. how that team? So, 20-person company, everybody's doing about eight jobs at that point. Uh, so yeah, so the data science team was me uh, and one other full-time gentleman named Henry. Um, and we were pretty much software engineers at the beginning of the day. At, at 20 people, you know, there is one there's one SQL database. There are no clusters. Uh, so it was a lot of shipping code. Essentially, anything that was too math heavy to to sort of uh, your standard CS background uh, wouldn't be good at. Essentially, me and Henry took off. So it was writing version zero, dynamic pricing of our ETA engines, of our supply forecast, demand for. Basically, it, it was shipping code and then unit tests. So. Uh, I had never done professional software engineering before I went to Uber. I probably committed every mistake in the book, but it was probably the quickest way to up your programming skills is just to fall in and do it. So starting out, it sounds like the, the data science functions at the company were, were a lot more product focused, like they... Yeah, I, it was very much... Yeah, yeah. ETA engine? Yeah, exactly. So I mean, it was, it was engineering focused in the sense that you're building and shipping code, and all the engineering has to be product focused at, at that size. So you know, everything we did at, at Uber, we do at Uber, the insight is very close to sort of the user. It's very close to the, the front line of the product, if you understand what I'm getting at. Um, which was good and bad in the sense that like, it was great because it, it, you get this very healthy contact and you, you can't sort of go off on this flight of fancy. You're always thinking about like, I have to ship this thing that somebody uses to like, either make their living or get a ride around town. Um, it was also bad in the sense that like you, all of my academic sort of intuition doesn't necessarily apply here. So like, you know, like it, I need to be super rigorous. That's what my academic person is telling me. My product person is saying like, I need to make sure that somebody can understand this. So some of like great example of this was early search pricing models. We had like, I'm not sure how many people have used Uber like in the last, well like we're using Uber two and a half or three years ago. Yeah, there's my man in the back. No, <laughs> So if you originally saw the search pricing screen, I'm not sure how many people, it was a wall of text. Like it was like size 12 font. And I think I've showed it. Um, which to an engineer is like, of course, right? Like I read text all day, I'm very detail oriented. You're not thinking about customers and like the, I've had three to six to 12 drinks, it's three in the morning, I'm not really reading walls of text. So like that was the big thing. The academic in me is like, well of course, like why don't people understand this? And the product person is like, well no, well no shit. Language, but um, that so that was the sort of context that you have to learn. That I did think I'd have to learn the data science. Yeah. Uh, so the ETA engine, for those unfamiliar, is like uh, when you load up Uber, it tells you if yeah. So like from one address to so like from here to 10th and Market on Tuesday, 11:30 in the morning, it takes 12 minutes essentially. So time of travel between any two locations, and a whole bunch of observables about when the trip happens. How did that, can you walk us through like that specifically, like how did that come about, like you, you and one other person were working on that? Sure. What did you write it in uh, and, and how has it come to evolve? It's like evolved to yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, originally um, we started out cheating and we just did a pass through from Google. Uh, and, uh, the guys who do transportation best. And then you figured out pretty early on uh, that Google isn't super great at short distance trip, short, I mean most of our trips are, our customers are like within five or ten minutes of their location, or drivers are within five or ten minutes of their customer, and that's not really Google's strong suit, right, they're building like a general purpose, and needs to calculate from here to Tahoe, as well as from here to Tempton Market, so 
we had a single use product, so we realized that we could get better by just optimizing against one specific use case. Uh, and, and so it started out with like Google, and then you could build a, a model that said uh, scale Google by 20% you know, across the board, and that gives us a little bit better number. Scale Google by 20% in the mornings and 30% in the afternoons. You, know, you could just start doing simple models which take Google as raw Google all the way to like Google Plus, and then, wow, well, Google Plus Plus, uh, I'll drop the product names, and then, um, then it's something where it's like, okay, you now just base this totally on Uber information. So, uh, based on every trip we've had between here and Tenden Market, what can we guess? We, we sort of infer about, uh, about a travel time. And the nice thing about our information is I know that, like, for example, you're driving a Tahoe. Uh, versus a Prius, you know, like in Paris, for example, there are, there are motorcycles, obviously very different in traffic. That we all that we factor all that in, and so what ended up happening is our first like 12 iterations of, uh, of the ETA engine were essentially sitting in, in our code base. And we realized that this is like the perfect sort of Bayesian committee machine. You can just sort of then take all these and do an ensemble method. So then, whenever a new city starts up, they actually just we just throw the entire suite of models at them in such a way it's a weighted average that it teaches itself functionally better travel time as we get more and more information. That's cool. Like so as you collect more data, then you can use it, but in the beginning you had a big Right. Job. In the beginning when it was one city, it was just we're iterating on a product for like the first twelve or fifteen versions of the models and then we're like, hey we all these and this is sort of the history of our of our sort right. of tech evolution at NSF. Why doesn't it work somewhere else? So yeah. That's exactly what we I, I was a physics major as well. Did you find that that helped you in data science, like understand data? Uh, yeah. Did, did you recommend that for people thinking of going to data science, like first go to physics? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, go back and get the I know, like, if um, if you've got a graduate degree, but I remember physics, yeah. for those of you who have taken this, it was like um, freshman year you learn physics, right? You think you learn physics. And then sophomore year, they come in and they say, everything you learned freshman year was wrong. Or it's approximation, right? We're going to teach you like slightly more advanced. And basically progress. And then you get to graduate school, and they're like, remember all those four years of physics? That was all garbage. And you start <laughs> over again, and like, do it with like answer vector calculation. Um, that mentality of sort of being comfortable with approximation and being sort of just well, like being a little suspicious about math is, is actually incredibly healthy for startups. I think it was yeah. a good mentality about like, you know, that, that this is an approximation that works and I can sort of, I can understand that I'm comfortable with like not having the perfect answer, not building the perfect product. I think that's super healthy. Um, the other thing is just physics is essentially applied word problems and sort of applied like, I know this about the world, turn it into math, that's data science. So I think you know, that, that sort of approximation and, and observation turning into math is huge for success. So yeah, I highly recommend it. Obviously I'm biased, but yeah. I, I liked it. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, you also uh, have given several speeches and you use the term data hacking. What, yeah. what does that mean? Do you like that over data science or what? Yeah, um, that, that was my own sort of, per I'm doing a social experiment, I'm trying to coin my own buzzword. So. <laughs> <laughs> if data hacking catches on, you were Starting here at the beginning. Um, um, no, but <laughs> my approach to it was, um, Data science is, is, is its own buzzword and it's positive and negative, right? It encapsulates a whole bunch of different ideas which are sort of loosely connected. And that's positive, right? It lets you put your finger on something. At the same time, it's not specific. Um, so my attitude was kind of more that you know, data hacking was my take on that sort of very early iteration in Uber, very engineering heavy form of data science. But there, there's a lot of obsession that, 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 like at larger companies, and rightfully so, because it's, it's frankly you know, how they defend their shareholder interest to make a bunch of money, and just focusing on a process, right? Like I, uh, at this point, Gmail is pretty much what Gmail is going to look like, you know, and the, and the data problems are what they're going to be, and you need to solve those problems better, right? And that's an obsession with six decimal places, the eight decimal places. That's the newest, most cutting edge research, and that that is data science. Right? That's, that you hire people who do data science to solve those problems. That's a very different attitude than I have three months left on my company, Rugway. I solved this really math hard problem, and you've got nobody else except you and essentially a guy who could maybe review your code, uh, fix this problem, go. Right? And that, that's also considered data science for a lot of startups. So that latter example is something I really call more data hacking because it, it requires you to aggressively hang up your sort of academic 
obsession with, with eight decimal places and perfection, but it also requires a huge amount of data intuition, visual intuition. Well, all of the sort of first order prerequisites for when somebody considers a data science career. That was sort of my take on it. And you're saying you even need to, uh, with that process for search pricing, you even need to know a little bit of the interface. And like exactly, yeah. It, it, it's, so it's as much about the math as it is about the context and the sort of business context you're working in. Yeah. Um, which is awesome and it's fun and it, and it, you know, it lets you build amazing stuff, but it, 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 it's orthogonal enough to the sort of large quote unquote big data or, or process obsessed data science that I wanted to sort of name it differently, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so you started Uber and there were two data science, 20 people, yep. 10%. Yep. Uh, what does Uber look like now? Uh, very different company. Uh, in a good way, uh, we're up to about a thousand people around the world. Uh, I am now running a team of about 20 data scientists. And I'm saying about because uh, even as we've gotten bigger and we sort of have maybe evolved out of pure data hacking and into much more uh, traditional data science world, the, the line is intentionally blurry. I like engineers who have sort of a data bank. I like you know analysts and, and professional academics who have always really wanted to ship code, and like so that that's a little bit in flux. But yeah, I'm, I run about 20 people at this point, cool. and then we have our own data. Where our engineering team's about 200 total, so we've got our own data engineering team, our own infrastructure team, uh, which is awesome because uh, trying to you know, ship a machine learning problem while trying to redeploy the server while trying to firefight is like the worst possible experience. I don't ever encourage anyone to try it. Hire a good infrastructure DevOps person and a data engineer as soon as possible. Uh, it really helps your the, the, the problem solvers solve problems without worrying about hardware. And that's, that's 200 people total infrastructure? No, 200 people total in engineering plus another 20 or so in product. Right. Yeah, so most of it's business operations, finance, legal, the whole, the whole the rest of the business. Right. Uh, and how many of those people like in infrastructure engineering can I focus on? Uh, getting your data to a place where you guys can analyze it. Sure. Uh, are they doing a lot of data cleansing, or is this like more like running the operation you guys set up? So, so infrastructure is mainly considering like uh, organization, or like the technological stability, right? Like that. I don't want to be thinking about whether the server is up or down. I, this is standard DevOps stuff, right? I just um, <coughs> the server should just work, and they and there's a whole ton of work that just makes it that goes into making it look dead after this. So they sort of just give us the sandbox to play in. Uh, yeah. Data engineering is very much concerned with getting information out of our stack and into the database. So everything that, that's sort of scaling inbound. And once it's in the database, that's where my team pretty much takes over. So there's very little data cleaning besides like uh, the sort of working around technological limitations or you know, this server crashed, how do we gracefully handle that in sort of a data sense? But you know, once the information is in there, and it's sort of, then it's my team's job to essentially pull it out, parse it, clean it, the whole thing around the front. Cool. So uh, there's a lot of data hackers in the audience today. Uh, what do you guys specifically look for when, yeah, <laughs> uh, what do you guys kind of use, uh, look for when uh, hiring uh, in, in sure. your group? Yeah, I, I gave uh, an interview which was incredibly well read. You guys have an awesome blog, but I gave an interview to them where I, I had, uh, about a year ago I'd say at this point, yeah, right? yeah. Um, where I said that the programming is probably your least marketable skill as a data scientist. And I think that, that this really resonated with a lot of people. Um, and I think it was easy to misunderstand what I was saying, but in the sense that like in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco, working in startups in 2014, coming in and telling me you know how to program, is like your least unique defining characteristic. I mean, like I think it's important and I value it. Uh, but what I look for in people uh, who, who come to work at, at Uber are, do you have the, the math and statistical chops to the point where it's intuitive, right? Like the, the problems um, can get hard, but you get a lot of free leverage by just being able to like jump to a few conclusions based on what you know about statistics. So for example, um, even just simple stuff like uh, ETA, so for example, time of travel, it is always bounded by zero. It goes zero to infinite, right? And that's just sort of obvious information you know about uh, the input space of a given of a given data set. 
And so, you know, given that ETAs can never be negative, just being able to assume like, okay, I know that this will be a long tail distribution without even looking at the piece of information, a huge piece of free insight that a lot of people, you know, that you sort of, I don't want you to sit there and think about it, re-derive something, which you can just sort of lead to, to be like, oh, I know it's bounded by zero. Right? Um, so there's that sort of, that's what I mean by intuitive statistical mathematical chops. Um, Technological challenge, the, you know, the, the programming, like I was saying, it, it sounds a bit paradoxical. It's not um, your best marketable skill set, but it is necessary to be successful. You don't need to be a professional software coder, um, but the fact that you're working in an engineering department, working with people on a day-to-day -day basis, and frankly, working with a, a data stack that's not super, super well evolved, that's not by no means turnkey, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, means that you need to have enough familiarity with computers with working on the command line where that's not intimidating or scary. Mm -hmm. um, and then definitely the product mindset of, you know, I, I wish we don't work in an ivory tower, we are right at the front line. Um, and that, if you would want to come with this team, that should sound like a positive, that's exciting and cool for you. Uh, and so I'm like, and then in passion for the company. With it, this, Uber is a passion-driven company, San Francisco is a passion-driven city, you know, like you better love what you're doing and want to be there. Yeah, that sounds like a, a very physics answer. No, like in physics, you're just like, down. your professors just expect you to know how to code or be able to, like, okay, code this, and they're like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to code, but I guess bigger. Um, Coming full circle, Zipfin is an amazing group of guys, good human beings, amazing corporation, uh, and they make some smart adult data science stuff. I just, I want to plug them because they're, they're friends of <laughs> mine. <laughs> uh, cool. I'll ask uh, a couple more questions and then open it up to the audience. So, so start thinking about your questions now. <laughs> um, uh, what, uh, what, how data driven do you think Uber is as a company? And then, well, there's another buzzword. Yeah, data driven <laughs> is a buzzword. Uh, but you, you get what it means. And sure. Then, I don't know how else to describe that. And then, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then um, you know, how do you suggest other companies do a good job of, of, of utilizing, looking at the data? Sure. Um, to as, as much as a company can be data-driven, I think we're, we're pretty good at it, um, in the sense that you know, we, um, we try to be in, involved in most of the strategic decisions. But I think that I always get annoyed by, by data, that, that term, and it's nothing personal I'm just thinking about, um, <laughs> is that, like, a startup, it, well, <laughs> right. I mean, a startup isn't really a car, it's more of like a school of fish or a flock of birds and like there's a whole bunch of stuff moving mostly in parallel with no real clear organizational structure. I mean like maybe you guys have an org chart but like the reality how you solve problems is just pretty well known. Um, and if you want to drive something like that, like you need to be at the front of the pack, right? So, like the, the school of fish is driven by the fish in front. Not necessarily the boss fish, or, you know, um, <laughs> and so like my entry for my guys is like if you want to be data driven, right? If you want data to drive, then you need to move faster than everybody else. Right? You need to be at the front of the pack. So if you're optimizing for anything, it's optimizing for getting to the answer faster than your CEO because your CEO sort of realizes he wants to do this, and the data people aren't in the room or aren't, aren't like fast enough to keep up. They're going to leave you behind, and that's just the. I mean, and frankly, that's how a business should be in the sense that. You know, a business needs to move at the speed of the business or else it's going to die. Um, and, and so my mentality is very much that, you know, I think of, uh, I try and harp on my analysts to get ahead of the problem, to get ahead of the team in, in the way that I think helps the company that puts us in the best possible position. So, make sense? Yeah. Uh, cool. And what's your infrastructure like? Uh, how do you guys store and deal with your data and what programming language do you normally use? Massive folders. No, not just. <laughs> um, no uh, Uber on the back end is a Python shop. So we, yeah. um, Pyramid, we have our own form of Flask for lighter forms, of ser lighter service oriented stuff. Sits on top of a ton of Postgres clusters at this point. Uh, we started out MySQL, migrated from MySQL to Postgres with no downtime. Uh, my DevOps team is incredible. Uh, it only took them. Um, uh, about six months and I think I didn't sleep for like five days leading up to it, but it was an awesome experience to get done. Uh, Postgres is nice because we get PostGIS and a whole bunch of other spatial extensions. And then sitting on top of all that is a massive data warehouse built in Vertica, as well as a whole bunch of flexible storage in S3. We don't have our own Hadoop cluster or any of these sort of big data crunching tools. We're all, we're a whole Amazon Web Services shop. So, cool. Elastic Mac is Redshift, I don't know. Uh, 
uh, yeah, that's all of my questions. Uh, do we have questions now from the audience? Yeah. Oh, sorry. You, you, yeah. Hey, sorry. Uh, so say my background's in uh, computer science. Sure. Uh, and I want to give myself the credibility of saying, I have the statistics the, and the math chops for this. How do I go ahead and do that on my resume if it's something I've just done on my own? Sure. Uh, first of all, I, I don't want to, uh, I want to be very clear. Doing it on your own is not, especially for startups, in my opinion, is not a negative. I think, you know, I look for every resume should have a GitHub attached to it or a GitHub to it. You know, and it should have stuff in it. I think you know, the, the, the skill set of well, I'm an amazing coder and I sort of want to learn the statistics out, uh, there's definitely a, the ability to, to pick this up on your own and sort of play around with your own project. I mean, machine learning, uh, there's several great, I mean, Coursera does an amazing course, Stanford has one. And just doing that on your own and then sort of playing around with some of those examples, absolutely a great, a great sort of focus for me. I mean, Again, I was saying this is a passion-driven company. The fact that you're doing it on your own tells me you're way more passionate about it than like I majored in machine learning. Not digging that, but I'm saying that you, that's a value, that's a marketable way of putting it. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Are there algorithms that you guys use above others, or they're more important? And slash, I, I, do people really use neural networks in production, or is that not happening? Sure. Um, generally speaking, I'm a problem-oriented person. I'm a problem-oriented solver, so. Uh, I don't usually focus, I, I don't really coach my, my guys and girls on, on a method. So the, the algorithm is essentially the algorithm we use, the one we, which we found that solved the problem with that. So like the, and I recognize that that wasn't what you were asking, but it's a common sort of uh, point of frustration with, with a lot of candidates where they're like, I want to come in and I want to do MCMC or I want to do stochastic gradient descent. And I'm like, that's awesome, but that's also sort of like if you go to a wood shop, you're like, you know what, I just, I want to use the drill press. Like, that's all I really want to do. <laughs> like, machine learning algorithms are tools that we use to solve problems. And I would much rather have that mindset of like, I want to come to a wood shop, and I want to build a crib. I want to build the best crib ever. And like, whatever it needs to get there, awesome. And data science is the same thing. We're like, I really want to solve the hardest, most interesting problems I can find, and whatever algorithm gets me there, so much the better. So. We don't have a strong type classic algorithm. Traditionally, though, I mean, uh, we're using a lot of algorithms that have to do essentially with stochastic gradient. I sort of gave myself away. This is that that uh, a two-sided marketplace, every transaction depends on everything that happened before it. So, for example, like the fact that a car was available to pick you up is a function of you know where the last person who used that car let it out at, what that driver is thinking about doing, and how many other people didn't get in that car until point. Time team. So there, there's a massive amount of, you know, all those problems are used for solving highly stochastic systems, just come to play a lot of new. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. I was going to ask, you mentioned the intuitions earlier. How do you know, I guess, how do you go about learning those intuitions and how do you know that you're ready? A lot of pain. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I ran search pricing for a year and a half and, and probably was terrible at it for about the first year of it. Um, and, and I mean, a lot of it is not necessarily so much of the, the uh, you know, I, I have to determine a priori what the best path is, but you, you save yourself a lot by being manically obsessed with what you're doing and then just immediate feedback. So there was a lot of, you know, we would you know, ship and deploy six or eight versions of surge in a week sometimes. Um, thankfully it's calmed down from that. But you can get a lot of sort of free mileage that way. And I think that, that Uber was a place that has a, has a very high tolerance for risk, sort of as an institution. Um, you know, there were definitely inst instances early on where I'm sitting there talking with Travis, with our CEO, we're like, you know, if, if this goes sideways, like we could crash the company, like literally put us out of business because I'm like, what happens if it's like 100X and people like never want to use Uber ever again, I just destroyed the company. But Travis is kind of like, hey, just, just turn it off if it gets, you know, like it was like, just whether well, just do it and you turn it off quickly, you know, kind of thing. And you know, that, that's actually got a lot of value. I think that's a, that's a very healthy way to approach it. Don't crash your company. You don't tell them I told you to do that, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, in the back. Uh, what are the interesting problems on the horizon for Uber? I mean, what are the interesting problems in data science on the horizon? Sure. Um, interesting problems in data science. I would not be presumptive enough to, to steer all over the field, but I can certainly talk to Uber. Um, I think it's very interesting from a purely logistics perspective. I mean, Uber is a is a 
a company people think is a cab company that's actually a tech company that's really a logistics company. And this is the day I'm about getting stuff to people when and where they want it. And right now what that happens to be is cars for looking for, for people who need rides. Uh, the operative words in the sentence are right now. Uh, and so, they, but it's interesting because like, you know, we do, we do, uh, you know, marketing things like on-demand Christmas trees and on-demand barbecue and on-demand ice cream sandwiches and all that. And you get every, like, you're familiar with these. Um, they don't call up the data science team to do that, which is really cool. This is, like I was talking about how like the ETA, engine alerts, um, we've got like a supply and demand positioning graphs and we took them all which teach themselves. And they just kind of work, like out of the box. It, um, there are always little quirks and stuff, but 95% of it just worked. And like the, the mathematician in me, the data scientist in me, appreciates the elegance of what that says. You know, that I could learn pork chop sandwich demand just the same as I could learn cow car demand. Is, uh, mathematically, they're very similar. So um, coming up with, with sort of perfecting those, those underlying models in a way that sort of whatever the business, the business again will tack whichever way it wants one of our massive problems, I think. And you can always, the other thing is very much personalization. Uh, so not just on the customer perspective, like I like to get picked up at this office and I like to go home, I'm very boring, but like on the driver side, uh, great example we gave, uh, one of our very first drivers was ben, named Benji. Uh, Benji's about 75. Um, and he's, he's, first of all, he's hilarious. If you've ever ride with Benji, you are in for a treat. Second of all, amazing service, but Benji is kind of like every other 75 year old in that like just a little bit on the slow side, which is like just five miles below the speed limit. Um, and like to the point where like we can sample a cohort of early drivers and I could pick Benji out as the outlier, right? So, like, uh, the fact that I can do that tells me a computer could do that straightforward too. Like that, 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 that sort of information is free information we can use to benefit our prediction. So something got very interested in the future. Or how much time do we have? I don't want us to run too late. Yeah. Uh, I was actually about to ask the uh, most interesting problems you are solving, but maybe he just asked your. Uh, I'm sure. going to ask why is one of the most challenging problems you are solving uh, at this moment and within the data set? The, the most challenging problems. Um, I think uh, ETA is definitely in the sense of you have a have a proof of concept and, and a system which teaches itself, which is no small achievement, but then how do we start factoring in things like road closures on the fly, like what I would like, as well as sort of short-term transportation dynamics. I mean, um, traffic is obviously always interesting. There's signals that like drivers are paying attention to, for example, like a Giants game gets out, semi-predictable, right? I can tell you like when the game is happening, it goes from anywhere from two to four hours. Very interesting to us. I would love to have a system in the perfect world where like a driver can just like erase a parade route, right? Or erase beta breakers like this road functionally doesn't exist and the whole system just teaches itself, reroutes all the drivers, redoes all the ETA calculations. Um, that'd be that's a massive benefit for us. I think something that, that no promises, but that, you know, something more tech. Yeah. I was curious to know a lot of the data science is around uh, the product itself, and I was wondering uh, if there's any do you support the business? Like, sure. Like, yeah, so my, my team does, it, we, we start out very much engineering product focused uh, and full of massive slice of what we do. Um, my team as well, we backstop our Uber's public policy group. So for example, you're meeting with the mayor of Chicago. Uh, uh, some really actually interesting pieces of analysis. For example, Uber's responsible for lowering the uh, mugging and robbery rate in Chicago. Uh, mainly because we're replacing cabbies who have these wads of cash because you have to pay in cash uh, with systems which don't require cash. So there's just fewer opportunities for that sort of uh, crime to occur. Uh, so Uber has a place in that, figuring out how big of a signal that is uh, and then actually like helping the policy team craft a strategy around that. A big part of what we do. Uh, we're responsible for lowering the DUI rate in Seattle. We found there's, these are all available on our blog, by the way. Check it out. But, uh, but again, policy work. Um, we work a little bit with our vehicle financing and insurance groups. Here's some data back up for that. Uh, and then a lot of it, a lot of the my team is the home for a lot of really deep dive, you know, very narrow, super deep uh, domain specific problem solvers. So fraud experts, uh, a few machine learning experts, these sorts of people who are like usually hired with one specific problem space in mind. 
And I will say that that's unusual for Uber. Generally, we hire for, for essentially for a pool and then just sort of allocate chase your passion. But, but for the guys who are like really like fraud is my jam, you can, you can be on my team and work with people. But yeah. One more. So, um, I, I work in a place where we have a lot of data and we don't have a lot of data science. Sure. Where, where do you start? Do you start with architecture, data engineering, data science? Like, how do you start solving problems? Start saving it first of all. I mean, like, literally, uh, you know, the, if there's been any free benefit of this proliferation of data science tooling, um, it, it makes data munging and data parsing and these sorts of things uh, incredibly useful and, and much less and much more friction I wouldn't say friction free but less friction than there was in, in, you know, even two or three or four years ago um, a lot of the sort of inputs for the, the third or fourth generation of Uber's data science models and sort of products started out as engineering models but they were just like we were tailing how many cars were each customer saw you know, just to from pure engineering support because they want to see like you know, the system crashed, oh my god, nobody's seeing anything what's going on, right? So like, but those become signals that you can use properly parsed, of course, for, for data science. So, I mean, even on flat files in S3, just get your engineers to start saving this in some sort of uh, annotated way, or just some sort of either human readable, or have some of you use like a log like uh, July 2014, I you know, did this to the Dubov, and this changed the data feed in this way. Like, a seasoned data scientist who has sort of the freedom and flack to really just dive into that will be able to make something out of it. So I, I mean, the, and that's, I would say, so if you want to say very first step, get your engineers to just start thinking about saving information. It's the second step. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, second step I would, would probably be to hire, hire on the, the data after, I guess if, we're, if that's taken off, but um, because, Trying to build an infrastructure and architecture or sort of to solve problems that you don't know what they are yet, almost by definition, you will not build the right thing. So I, I would rather hire in somebody who's thinking about the problem first. So what is the end product lawyer? What is what's the thing I need to do? And then work backwards, okay, then I need this team and I need this thing like this, and then you know, but, but work backwards from what you want it to look like. Otherwise you're just gonna sort of meander and not really it, it's not <coughs> You won't be doing the most high impact thing you could be doing with your sort of employee salary dollars. Make sense? Cool. I think that's all done. Again, let's give Kevin a round of applause.